Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Logos Project. This is your host, Dom, and in today's video, I am joined by Jeremiah Bannister and Timothy Flanders. Gentlemen, welcome to the channel. Yes. Thanks for having us. Jesus is king. Yeah, man. Wonderful. Well, uh, for the sake of the audience, uh, can uh, Jeremiah, would you mind introducing yourself, giving a, a short background and where we can find out your work online, stuff like that? Yeah, I, I actually feel badly going first because Tim is actually the head honcho of the channel that I'm with. <laughs> but, yeah, so, I, I, yeah. so I can I can double it up on this, right? So uh, I am the host of Paleocrat Diaries and been doing that for a long time, writing a book right now, actually, that's uh, going to be published very soon and super excited about that. It's about my daughter's life and death with childhood cancer and how that led our family back to the faith. And so uh, hopefully that'll be around Christmas. Um, prayerfully, so please keep us in prayer. But I, I host a show, and it's it used to be an AM FM talk radio show. I've done TV, I have a degree in journalism, I uh, used to be a pastor. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And in fact, if you'd like to know the wild, crazy story, I think the best version still to this day online is the one that Tim actually uh, hosted. <laughs> he, he interviewed me. I think it's if you go back, you have to push oldest videos first on the channel. It meaning of Catholic because I think it's the third one. I think it's the third mm. or fourth video in the history of the channel. Uh, and that's it's there. And so that goes through the whole history. But now it's mainly talks about uh, Catholic presuppositionalism. I'm mm. pretty much the poster boy for that uh, <laughs> online. It's true. <laughs> Just, we're the flagship. And um, and so there's that. And I talk a lot about enthusiasm, uh, Ronald Knox book, things like that. So. It's a whole bunch of a whole bunch of good stuff, cults, heresies, all that. It's a lot of fun. Wonderful. Timothy, how about you? Yeah. So Paleocrat Diaries is a megazord with <laughs> the meaning of Catholic. Yeah. Meaning of Catholic is a collaborative lay apostolate where different individuals and groups contribute different perspectives to manifest and attempt to achieve in some small way the meaning of Catholic on the on youtube and online so i am one of the contributors i'm the founder um and i bring a a some some form of trad view uh to that channel uh paleocrat diaries as well and we also we just had uh nicholas cavasso's traditional thomas he's been contributing lately as well uh we also have other contributors lots of volunteers and we have online uh the online guild group and we have uh, also, we have a penance sodality that I'd like to promote. It's uh, called the Fellowship of St. Anthony. And this is where lay people take on penance to offer penance in reparation for bad priests and in, uh, in petition for good priests. And that we can, as lay people, we can support our priests by offering penance in, a, in, a similar, in, in the spirit of St. Anthony of the desert, at, who as a layman, he went to the desert and uh, he was a lay monastic. And so uh, as lay people, we are taking on some penance. So that's the Fellowship of St. Anthony. Um, that's one of our groups at the Meaning of Catholic. So that's me. Awesome. Wonderful. And uh, for anyone new tuning in, uh, I'm Dom. I run the Logos Project, and we just focus on theology, um, philosophy sometimes, and uh, culture and things like that. And so, uh, yeah, so everybody, welcome. Make sure you like this video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, comment down below. And uh, if you enjoy this content, support us at patreon.com slash the Logos Project. Now, without further ado, uh, so I wanted to have this conversation uh, in, the, in our email exchange. Uh, Timothy pointed out that today is the anniversary, the 60th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council, which I had no idea. I just, you know, I didn't really notice that. So this is actually very providential. And so uh, our conversation today, I'm hoping, will be about the last 60 years, uh, the good, the bad, and what we can do about it uh, in our personal lives uh, or in our um, in our ministries, right? So uh, this conversation can you know go in any direction you guys want, but um, I guess I'll start off by maybe pointing out to some of the good fruits that I've seen myself in the last sixty years, and we'll talk about the negative as well. But uh, a few things that I've seen is that the, uh, since the council, there's been an empowerment of of, of the laity, and um, I think our our work here is a good example of this. But also in apologetics, with like uh, especially our Protestant brothers and sisters, uh, you know, Catholic answers, um, and uh, scripture scholarship in Catholic um, areas has exploded. We were kind of uh, behind from our 
our Protestant uh, confreres, right? So I'm thinking like Scott Hahn, the St. Paul Center, the whole Jewish Roots series with, uh, you know, Dr. Petrie, Dr. Barber, Dr. Burzma, all that kind of stuff. Um, and evangelization. So evangelization, um, you know, Word on Fire, Bishop Barron's ministry, uh, even the Dominicans in D.C. or the Thomistic Institute, uh, the Augustine Institute, uh, Ascension, uh, Ascension Presents, stuff like that. So that's some of the fruits I've seen. Um uh, also, seminaries at first, this will be more in the bad section. Seminaries were doing really poorly in the 60s, 70s, even 80s, I would say. But recently, I think things have changed a lot. Um, and uh, I would uh, point the audience to a video on Dr. Chap's channel uh, where Monsignor Michael, I think he, his last name is pronounced Hence, I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, but he talks about uh, the life of seminaries today, how things uh, are actually surprisingly good in seminaries uh, in general, of course. Uh, and so and I'll conclude with one fruit that I've seen as well is just this kind of focus on scripture, this kind of return to the centrality of scripture. You see this in Verbum Domini from uh, uh, Benedict XVI's um, uh, writing there. Uh, Bible studies are now much more common in Catholic parishes. Uh, I run one here. Uh, and then, of course, Bible in a Year by Father Mike Schmitz that, that you know, got really popular. Uh, you know, the Great Adventure Bible. So, you know, like stuff from Scott Hahn and Jeff Cavan and stuff like that. So that's kind of some of the good things that I've seen come about through this new emphasis on Scripture and uh, and addressing uh, Protestants, uh, you know, in today's day and age. Um, uh, so any one of you two can take it from there about, you know, positive things. And if you want to just go into the negative things, that's fine as well. <laughs> I'll let you start on that, Tim. Oh, so, I'll, I'll but, let you, buddy. I'll let uh, you start, man. Yeah. Well, there's a, yeah. um, I, I mean, I do think that there is a, well, when I think of um, focus on scripture, one thing that was, I know that we is directly tied to Vatican II is homiletics mm. as exegetic, exegetical expositions of Holy Scripture. Uh, yeah. Like I, I, when you, when you go back and there's uh, this collection of sermons from St. Alphonsus, which I love, I love St. Alphonsus. The sermons are fantastic, but the sermons are not really exegetical from the gospel itself. He basically takes a one line from the scripture and then he goes off on some other topic. And the, mm. the as I said, the sermons are fantastic. Um, but if you, <clears throat> there's this four volume set uh, that came out shortly before the council, but it's, it's um, a four volume set of just, uh, sermons of the fathers hmm. based on the different gospel passages of the yearly lectionary of the old mass. And when you read the homilies of the fathers, they're obviously scriptural exe exegetical exhortations. So it's interpreting the gospel and uh, exhorting the faithful towards various things based on that Holy scripture reading. And I know that that is um, directly tied to the council wanting to create so even at, even at the latin mass even at a trad parish you'll have you know you'd have the latin mass but you're you would generally have a sermon even at the latin mass in my experience that is an exegetical exposition of that gospel yeah and that seems to be directly tied to what the council was mm. uh seeking to accomplish with returning the centrality of scripture yeah yeah and just to add to that because i remember praying the uh, matins of the uh, old calendar and uh, uh, every time in Matins, there was these passages from the church fathers. Um, and uh, and this was when I was in the monastery before that I had never prayed Matins. But when I discovered those, those, those short homilies from the church fathers, I was enthralled. And uh, the, the beauty contained there was just amazing. So, yeah, sorry. But uh, Jeremiah, what, what do you think? <laughs> well, I, I, I'll leave it with this because I think you and I actually have uh, views that are more, more closely aligned than the views mm -hmm. that Tim and I have. We have we have some disagreements sometimes on some stuff. And it's actually part of the nature of the apostolate itself. It's one of the reasons why meaning mm -hmm. of the Catholic is such a special place. Um, mm -hmm. People in our day and age, you, you get in these bubbles, right? Where um, you're, you're part of an apostolate. Everybody is kind of on the same page, which there's a value to that. But there's yeah. also a value to having apostolates where people are not entirely on the same page. They are on the most fundamental thing. Right. Mm. So they are on those things that make you Catholic. That's where you are. But recognizing that there are many different schools of thought. Um, and so we come from a little bit different schools of thought on some things. Um, however, I, I want to just say this is that I I'm of the persuasion 
that a lot of the things that people attribute good and bad to the council ought not mm. to be attributed at all. Um, I did a series called on, on the book called Secular Age um, yeah. by Charles Taylor. And in that book, and I, I did it actually a review of it by James K.A. Smith called How Not to Be Secular. It's kind of a summer, summation of it a little bit. And he did a pretty good job, I think. But the basic idea is that over time, you have all different factors that come into play that result in what will eventually be the present of the future, right? So, mm. um, and sometimes we don't see how these things work together and how in a simple way, sometimes it's it's just the, the opening up of a social imaginary, what we can imagine possible, things like that, even if it's maybe politics or technology or whatever, sociology, or even customs and courtesies, etiquettes, things like that. Um, yeah. So those things play a role in how we view the world. And that that what happens with this is sometimes we end up acting in ways that previous generations would have thought is absolutely unreasonable. Like they, would, they couldn't even imagine what we, what we take for granted in many ways. And what we just yeah. assume, well, yeah, this is what, it, what it's like. I think that that is a huge thing with this. I think a lot of people would like to say, well, look, if you look at uh, Vatican II and then you see the decline of vocations or whatever, and they, they point to some kind of a thing or the loss of loss of belief in the Eucharist, and they mm. blame it on Vatican II. For one, I think that's a magic bullet theory. I do not mm. think that that is, I don't think that that's defensible. I think at yeah. best, the best you could do is say it's something akin to it's wet outside, therefore it must have rained. You're not even recognizing the guy over with the hose on the side of the house. And so I think that it's a logical fallacy that is at play frequently, not all the time, but frequently. And I think that a lot of this uh, can simply be, you know, how would how would uh, modern people in a society like we have with views about individualism, democracy, scientism and the like, um, how would how would any civilization with that kind of social imaginary approach an ecumenical council? Because that wasn't what the people were before. They just yeah. they did not think that way. And so we can't really I don't think it's even fair to judge in that manner. And I think in the same token, sometimes people when they say, well, these are the positive fruits of it. I think those are overblown too. some of them, for example, I've highlighted before being um, things to do with methods of hearing mass. You hear a lot where people say, you know, you need to be, uh, they wanted active participation, right? They wanted right. to be able to participate more during the mass. And I'm like, mm -hmm. it's actually a real problem that they have because that's always been the case. And that case has been your activity is to prepare your hearts. Your activity is to do a method of hearing mass, multiple saints. In fact, I just found Another one I didn't realize was even in the Lassance guide. <laughs> it's one to Our Lady too, and so I there's one from uh, Saint Alphonsus. Another that I have from uh, Lassance, an indulgence method. I have one from Saint Francis de Sales that I use from my my prayer devotion book from 1938. Uh, but now there's another one with the Virgin Mary, and this is something that you are actively doing, right yeah. during the Mass. You are actively doing that, and. I think that a lot of the people that talk about not being active during mass, they don't even know if you talk mm -hmm. to them. I, I hardly ever meet anybody that complains about that from the old mass that then goes, oh, yeah, well, I knew all about methods of hearing mass. I did that regularly. <laughs> That's just fake. They don't that most of them have no clue. So even the things that sometimes people say as a positive fruit, I think that those things can be overblown and can be the problem can be attributed to something other than what is commonly attributed by people in the popular yeah. debate between trads and. Yeah. Uh, to, trad. to add to that, Rook, I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think, uh, you know, it's easy to just right away, you know, be like, okay, the council is responsible for all this good stuff or the council is responsible for all this bad stuff. I think there's a sense in which when it comes to scripture specifically, you could say the council isn't and yet is. And what I mean is that I think what's really responsible is, for example, the work of Ratzinger in facing the crisis of of uh, historical critical method and it's like uh, very erroneous presuppositions, but also like, you know, the source Christian movement in France, this kind of return to the fathers in scripture. 
what I, I think the council, what it did is it ratified this in, in a certain sense. And Dei Verboom, I think, I think we shouldn't, um, um, uh, we, we, it can't be overemphasized, I think, the impact of Dei Verboom when it comes to scripture and how Catholics approach it. Um, so there's a sense in which the council isn't really the source, it's the people before the council, but I think the council kind of said yes to this or something, you know, this kind of return to, to scripture. So, um, yeah, that's what I would add well, to that. Let, let me bring up a negative, which I would attribute to the council directly. Um, mm -hmm. And that is the um, there's a lot of different factors here. And I just found out recently that uh, Archbishop Lefebvre at the council suggested that there there be two sets of documents. There be a doc, documents for the theologians and then documents for the common people. Yeah. And uh, I think that this was actually a good insight of his, in my view, um, because one of the problems with a loquacious council, which is very, it's, it's the council is without a doubt the most loquacious council in the history of councils. Um, and the appendix of Lumen Gentium says that the theological note of the council in general mm -hmm. is according to the norms of theological interpretation, which are quote, known to all. Mm -hmm. And um, De Verbum 11 introduces an ambiguity about a uh, point of modernism that had been formally condemned um, by multiple encyclicals since Providentissimus Deus against Alfred Loisy under Leo the Thirteenth, which is the the error or the heresy of limited inerrancy, which is where Loisy said that the Holy Scripture it contains errors; it contains historical errors or various different errors uh, in it, and this this doctrine, this error, was condemned. Under Leo the Thirteenth, under Benedict the Fifteenth, it was condemned in Pius the Twelfth in two different encyclicals. In fact, Pius the Twelfth even says that this this heresy is quote already often condemned. Um, but at at Vatican II, there were people who were pushing this heresy nonetheless. Uh, Archbishop or Cardinal Koenig of Vienna even said on the council floor that the Bible contains errors. He said, hey, the Bible contains errors because we've had new archaeological studies and we've proven that there's errors in the Bible. And so they were pushing for this to the, be the case. And the problem is that <clears throat> the Revelaciones had the, the language in it was very, very crystal clear that it excluded any sort of error in the Holy mm -hmm. Scripture. The language which was subsequently adopted by De Verma 11 does not exclude that interpretation um now officially now here's where we get into the theological norms of interpretation which are fuzzy uh the relatio at the council confirmed that de verbum 11 should be taken to exclude this error so that's that that should be understood as the, the official interpretation of de verbum 11 uh, but the problem is by adopting a more ambiguous way of saying it and by jettisoning the previously crystal clear way of excluding the error, uh, this error nonetheless has become something that became quite prominent under uh, Father Raymond Brown, who was Pontifical Institute of Scripture. He was promoting this yeah. error in the Jerome commentary. It was so bad that uh, the Synod of Bishops uh, under Benedict, when they were doing the Synod of Bishops in preparation for Verbum Domini, all of this documentation, by the way, is in my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible. I, I have all the documentation, all the citations here. Mm -hmm. um, but because of this ambiguity and because of the breakdown of theological understanding, people didn't even know Latin to be able to read this Lazio to even fleshly understand De Verbum 11. In the Synod, they actually, in the Instrumentum Laboris, they officially put, uh, put the term only, they added the word only, to De Verbum 11. And if you add mm -hmm. the word only, it becomes heretical. Uh, and that was in uh, Instrumentum Laboris. Mm. Now, they appealed to Benedict, and and uh, in a, he he chose not to resolve it. And he, he, he said, I, I don't want to answer this. Uh, I, I would like to work on this further. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't really seem to make sense to me. I, so, like, I mean, I'm just a layman, and, you know, I need to yeah. teach my, my children I need to teach them the Holy Scripture. And one of the things mm -hmm. I'm going to teach them is that the Holy Scripture is infallible. There's no errors in the Holy Scripture. In fact, Ratzinger confirmed <clears throat> that this, the doctrine of the er inerrancy of the Holy Scripture is a de fide dogma. 
He confirmed mm-hmm. that in his in his uh, nine, 1990s commentary on the Professio Fidei. So I, I, I view I view this as not really a laughing matter. Uh, you know, we're talking about heresy here. We're talking about de fide dogma. And I, I was I was clued into this because I, I actually read this. This this is a very good text over here by Matthew Levering. Matthew Levering yeah. is a great, great scholar. And this book, Vatican II Renewal Within Tradition, there's two different essays on Dei Verbum. And what's crazy is that, you know, this is a document, this is a book that's trying to be totally faithful to Vatican II, interpret it within tradition. But what's crazy is that the two essays in this volume interpret Dei Verbum totally differently. One of them says it teaches limited inerrancy, which I'm saying is a heresy. Mm-hmm. And the other one says it that's a totally wrong interpretation. That's obviously the right interpretation. But I, I would I'm I would argue, as I argue in my book, that the trads do have a point here, I think, uh, because we have a, a situation where there was an ambiguity created by a situation. Um, I don't think it, it it like I said, the official formal teaching of Vatican II does not actually teach heresy uh, because you have to interpret it properly. <clears throat> but in the whole event of Vatican II, I would attribute to this this whole situation created by this ambiguity as attributable to attributable to Vatican II in some way. So that's my that yeah no connection. yeah. What's uh just for clarity? Um, yeah. when you're talking about inerrancy, are you talking about uh, are you distinguishing between infallibility and inerrancy? Just for people who may be watching, are you distinguishing between those two concepts? And secondly. Are you referring only to the autographs or are you referring to all like every single uh, d- uh, scroll or parchment we've got um, any no, manuscript it, or is it, it just it, simply the autographs? It's the dot. It's the doctrine contained by Leo the 13th and Providentissimus Deus where he quotes in Augustine, which sums up the, the opinion <clears throat> of all the fathers where he says, Augustine says, if I find something that seems to be contrary to the truth in the scriptures, He says, one, either I've got a bad copy, Mm -hmm. so there could be an error in a copy of a copy of a scripture. That could happen. Or um, two, I I don't understand. There must be some mystery here that that doesn't really make sense, but there there shouldn't be a there shouldn't be a um an error. Um and then what what is the third possibility? I'll have to to grab I got Denziger right here. I'll look it up. I forgot what the, the third thing is, but basically the fathers assume that any contradiction is just an apparent contradiction to scripture. And so they go to yeah. great lengths to just reconcile everything and that this is a different sense. And this, they do all sorts of gymnastics to reconcile it all because it must be all true. Yeah. So, um, yes, there can be an error in a copy of a copy. Um, I think, right. Well, and in, I'll only say this because I don't want to get wrapped up in it. Uh, it's yeah. just that I think that it is, I think it's more ambiguous than people think. Um, actually like in reality, because, you know, if we look at, if we look at, uh, documents and you say, well, we've got manuscripts that have different renderings. We have different manuscripts that have, uh, passages that we have to put footnotes in to say, this is not included in the earliest manuscripts, even down to the number 616 and 666. Uh, yeah. the earlier manuscripts have 616. We can say that's a scribal error. And, and but that forces us back into the world where we say, that the truth that the scripture is teaching is infallible, right? That that itself, and that there's no error at all in that. But that's not just in and of it. We can say it in and of itself, but we don't know that in and of itself. We know that through faith in the church as the well, vehicle through yeah. which we can understand and interpret scripture because the church herself is infallible. So yeah. that's what I, I would say to me. I don't know if I, would, I wouldn't attribute a, like a, an unnecessary ambiguity on the council when I think that the actual conversation itself is tougher than, than people might think. Yeah, that's a good point, Jeremiah. But can I just add like, cause you, uh, Timothy brought up the, you know, the father saying, well, if there's a tension, it's an apparent contradiction. I yeah. think we should apply that not just to scripture, but to the magisterium as well here. And a certain hermeneutic needs to be in place. I think that, uh, especially because Ratzinger is behind a lot of Dave Verboom and he, you know, said that this is dogma and it's not limited inerrancy. Uh, it seems to me that what we see instead here is a, a a new emphasis on salvation history. So it's not that everything 
in scripture that has to do with salvation is infallible, but things that have to do with history aren't. No, it's that history itself is for the sake of salvation. And so here we have, I think, uh, a, a kind of not not a development because it's already there in the tradition, but a deepening and a focus. And I think that uh, what we have here, it, um, it basically, what was I trying to say? It's it's a it's a return to uh, this understanding that uh, God acts in history, and everything that happens is for the sake of our salvation. So, um, in other words, I, I think you have to approach it. Uh, okay, so what I was trying to say, modernism, right, brought in this this question. Maybe there's error in the scriptures. The church put its foot down and said, no, there's not. But I think what Dave Abram is doing is answering the questions that come along with uh, the heresies of modernism, which is what Jeremiah was pointing out, which is, wait a minute, though, there is tension, there is complications. How do we address this? So I think if we have that kind of hermeneutic of, okay, maybe the, the document here is trying to say something, as a Relatio explains, as Ratzinger explains, and if we have that that hermeneutic, then I think it we're we're more um, able to see what the council actually said, and not say not go with the progressive saying, oh, it's limited inerrancy, or with uh, I would say the, the traditionalist, which is saying the council is ambiguous for evil purposes. And I mean, um, you know, that there were some uh, pro progressives at the council. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And, but I would say, you know, there were Arians at Nicaea. That, that that's the, what the council does. It disputes. And then someone wins and the other people lose. And then the, the church's authority is saying this is the proper way of doing things. And then subsequently after the council, the popes, you know, clarify. So I think that this can be a dangerous path. We need to ground our, our reform on the authority of the council and the popes and the church uh, and not with this hermeneutic of suspicion towards them, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, I'm not I don't have a, a hermeneutic of suspicion. I'm simply stating that, uh, you know, it, it's not that simple, Dom, because as I said, yeah, this whole book is trying to do what you just said, and yet it gets <laughs> Dave Arabum 11 wrong. Why? Yeah. Because it's ambiguous. I'm just, and it's okay. It's okay when a council is ambiguous. Trent was ambiguous about temporal and spiritual authority. You, you could yeah. even you could attribute that failure right. perhaps to uh, you could say, well, that that helps the rise of absolute monarchy, which helped the lives of liberal liberal French revolution. But all of these yeah. things are under the providence of God. God is in control. And just because, uh, I mean, councils, I yeah. councils just don't have the time to answer every single ambiguity yeah. here. And that. so, and sometimes even in like at Trent or at various councils, yeah. they'll actually intentionally put an ambiguity simply because they don't want to resolve that question right now. They're like, hey, that, that's wait, that, we don't have time for that. We're just going to put yeah. an ambiguity that everybody can agree on. And that's okay. Uh, yeah. but even, I, I mean, I, I think that there, there's still, I, even if there are enough, I would, I, I mean, there are nefarious actors at every council, there's evil men working things. And sometimes they might even get some, uh, they might get the church to give them a, an inch or whatever here or there that yeah. doesn't invalidate anything to me. Cause I mean, I think that there's, there's machinations of evil men at every council. Uh, there's things going on and, uh, that's it's it's not a failure of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to lose faith in the church just because there's yeah. there's something a little bit difficult right here. Um, I I think that uh, I mean this is not I, a, yeah. Oh, I, I ahead, agree, Tim. I, I I concede that I I agree. But but my fear is that it becomes a hermeneutic, not just a, a historical instance. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and I I also concede your point. I think that there is a there is a trad tendency as I've said mm -hmm. publicly elsewhere, this is the Neo-Jansenism that Jeremiah both and I, as uh, Jeremiah has brought out with uh, Knox's work with Jansenism, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I view Jansenism as an attitude of uh, just bad faith, an attitude, an attitude of, I want to find a loophole somewhere yeah. in a magisterial everything to try to get out of my responsibility to be a humble son of the church. That, that to me, that that's like a Jansenist attitude. And I think there is a trad attitude like that, which yeah. is a, like a hermeneutic of suspicion. <clears throat> that's just sort of like, like, I, I, I think that there are cases. I think there are cases. So, for example, subsisted in is another example of that, which is where. Yeah, um, that, that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes, it's like, I mean, I think like subsisted in is sort of ambiguous at face yeah. value, because like if you're not familiar with it, it's just like that doesn't make sense. It seems to yeah. indicate. But if you dig deeper into it, that phrase was actually introduced by a an Orthodox trad Jesuit, Sebastian Trump, who was the theological advisor of uh, Pius XII. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he actually added that in simply to reconcile the, the yes. situation they were trying to discuss there. 
But the problem is that you do have a, a bad, a Jesuit name only. Yeah. Father John Brown is always commenting and, and saying, you, you're always commenting <laughs> about bad Jesuits. So I, I want to give Father John Brown, if he's, if he's watching, yeah. I just made a comment about a good Jesuit who did a good <laughs> thing. Uh, but um, the problem is that that sort of, because there's this, there's this breakdown of, of theological understanding. People don't even, they don't know Latin anymore. Even in Rome, they're not teaching Latin. It's all German. And uh, people just take, take something that's maybe an inch because the mm -hmm. problem is you might have, um, you know, Sebastian Trump, who's introducing subsisted in to try to make a more precise definition of the church, which is what that is yeah. in reality. But then you also have these heretics on the other side and we're like, actually, yay, we do want that. Cause then we can use that. And I think both of those things are happening at Vatican too. And that doesn't, that doesn't invalidate or could yeah, yeah. say that that's like really an error, but it's sort of yeah. the distinction that I have attempted to work with is the distinction between uh, the theological meaning of Vatican II and then the historical meaning. Because we could even, I think the trads could even say, hey, let, what, let's just concede the whole, uh, you know, the whole council is not to blame at all. But the reality of what happened was, is that I'm a lay faithful at a parish and my bishop approves this bad Jesuit to come to my town. And he starts saying subsisted in means total indifferentism. And since I'm just a lay faithful and I don't know, I'm not like theologically educated, I don't understand that that's not true and so yeah. i end up believing in a heresy but that's there's on a on a historical level that was caused by the event of vatican ii in in, a, in the bad implication yeah. of it or whatever the whole event mm. caused a lack of faith here but you can blame the bishops yeah. for that, like well uh, i don't i don't think we disagree here but i mean i, I am kind of weary of saying that you know in any way vatican ii caused because other councils, you know, especially uh, Chalcedon, they at the after Chalcedon, because that the humanity and divinity of Christ and all that follows from that were listed side by side. Some people were saying that the Nestorians won uh, because it looks like, you know, there's a, there's a real uh, a, a distinction that is more than just a distinction. Uh, but Chalcedon didn't teach that because it also talked about the union in the person of Jesus. But I mean, I think this is true of all councils. And, uh, and my, my fear is that, um, you know, we're not interpreting Vatican II in the way that was not only intended by the winning party, but in the way that the text reads itself in light of itself, the whole, all the documents, as well as the past tradition. And I think it's very possible to do this. And it's not, you know, it, it, a little bit of study, um, but also a trust that, you know, the council is not to blame, I think is the only way we can push for genuine reform, right? By relying on the council. And um, oftentimes the accusation, accusations of ambiguity, like like, like you meant you brought up, subsistit, I don't think they work, and I think that it's unfortunate that people uh, do misunderstand this on the surface because of the secular culture. But I mean, um, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I, th I feel like the only way we can get through this is if we actually lean on the council, if that makes sense. Sure. Bannister, you yeah. Have well, I was, I was going to say something. Somebody mentioned in the comments about yeah. uh, De Clue. Oh, yeah. And he, he's got an excellent series right now on what is the Second Vatican Council and his yeah. first lecture on authority and continuity. Um, you know, yeah. he, he talks about uh, a, a saint, right, that shortly after Nicaea had a quote, right, and said mm -hmm. that um, and he said that yeah, it might be battle. familiar yeah, yeah, to your own battle. experience. Yeah. I And I'll just it's not long. It's really short. It says uh, the raucous shouting of those who through disagreement rise up against one another, the incomprehensible chatter, the confused din of uninterrupted clamoring has now filled almost the whole church, falsifying through excess or failure the right doctrine of the faith. Yeah. Um, I, you know, so that's a situation where, you know, we have a, a council that we can say it was because of when it happened, the historical event of that. And, <clears throat> But the church, the people who were faithful to the church, they yeah. didn't do what I fear anyway, that m many, if not most, trads tend to do. And that is to pin it on the council itself. I mean, listen to the way they talk. I don't, I don't I feel very lonely talking about the social circumstances building up to that and leading up to that regarding technics or politics or philosophy. Yeah. 
that led to social imaginaries that the way people approach the church at all. And we can see this even in the way that sometimes they'll use quotes like one from uh, um, uh, Pope St. Paul the Sixth, talking about the smoke of Satan, right? Entering in and they'll oftentimes attribute it to things that are the church and they'll blame it on the church. But that quote, he says, he blames it on science, right? And so, they, you know, he says, mm. he says that this is science. He actually, actually, it's a, there's a colon. And after the colon, it's science and period. And that's it. And mm. it's, and it makes sense if you think about it that way to say, well, yeah, you, you people struggle to believe in the things of faith anymore. Scientism has taken a hold. I just did a series on nihilism that talks about the history of that and the development of that over time. And even even the people who were opposed, right? Like the liberals, uh, the the modernists and or the, the, the realists and the vitalists and all the different kinds of uh, yeah. liberals that were around. They, they disagreed with each other, but at the most basic fundamental level, they weren't different. Yeah. And so it ends up being a progressive march in a certain direction. But I, I feel like so often it turns into this thing and we see it all the time. I don't think there's any denying it where where people will go from questioning this and saying that it's ambiguous to then saying it's it's heretical or saying that the popes are heretical or that the magisterium is heretical, which leads to maybe the pope's not the pope. We see it all the time. And I I say that that to me bolsters my case because I'm saying that was not as true back in the old days that that's something rather new and i think that too is because of the way that we are hyper individualistic and that we are so democratic that we have a society that has been leveled a socialistic leveling that's taken place with a loss even in our imaginary of hierarchy we, people talk about it but they I, I think like for example i think it's great like the people that talk about monarchies and that they want a king back they can't even they can't even handle an executive <laughs> like they, they struggle they can't handle they can't handle the vicar of christ and yet they yeah. think they're all of a sudden going to take a knee for a king are they serious like what a joke they're I they're think, yeah. democratic modern people hyper individualistic they are there's a, a a buffered self that they're dealing with in the world there's a malaise that goes along with modernity and it results in this and that I think it throws blame in the wrong directions because at the end of the day, when they do that, when they blame the council or they blame the magisterium or they accuse and calumniate popes like that, when that happens, they're not doing that to people. They are doing that to Christ because Christ is the one who is the head of the church who guides the feet. The Holy Ghost is the one who preserves it through the negative charism of infallibility. We want to talk about infallibility. I think that's a, a, that is a core because even the scriptures that we say are infallible and the belief that we must believe they're infallible and inerrant comes from a church that we we must trust is infallible. And, and so, you know, to me, and the last thing I'll say is so much of this boils down, I think, to a, a struggle that on the most basic level, you know, somebody, somebody asked me recently, I saw a comment actually, uh, Dom, in your thread, yeah. somebody asked a question. And oh. said they were mocking you and somebody else and said, well, you mm. guys are coming against people for having their own private opinion. But this is your own private opinion kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And somebody asked, well, Jeremiah, how would you respond to that? And I'm like, well, if you listen to any of my shows, like that's like the yeah. core fundamental position I maintain. And I said it, it, that it's not about opinion. It's about the impossibility of the contrary. I said, but the thing is, is that with with so many of these critics, uh, controversies, it, you know, Tim, for example, I think he does a really good job in bringing up dubia and saying that there are, there's various dubia that have not been answered um, that are still kind of floating out there, even from Vatican one. And I just want to remind some of my trad friends and say, look, at the end of the day, you're leading where, where do you, where's the dubia going to the very person that you're accusing of heresy or to the very institutions that you say you can't trust anymore. And that have, that have defected or have deviated. I don't care what you're going to call it. But no matter what, I'm like, and you need to go to them? Like, why? And, and, it, and what if they sided with your opinion? Why would I need to listen to them? I could say, I think that they went off the rails. I just, I'd be invoking the same assumptions that trads are to say that I don't accept that. And we're back to what? Schwashbuckling with proof text. And I, well, think, I, think, I think that's that's a bad situation for people, everyday people yeah. who don't study theology very much at all and don't know Latin like Tim said. They don't know Latin. They don't know their theological mm -hmm. notes. 
that they're going to be in that position to make those decisions. I thank God that we don't have to do that. Yeah, I think you're right to bring up Charles Taylor. I mean, uh, and, you know, his book, uh, A Secular Age, because I really do think that the council is addressing secularism uh, and individualism. And to bring up a name that uh, trads usually don't like, but I think that's exactly what Delubach was trying to do with his book, uh, you know, Catholicism and, and the Supernatural, is to address those two things. And those things uh, are in the council. And uh, so and so it seems to me that uh, if, I, if I could, if it's okay to read a quote from actually Pope Francis in his homily today, I just uh, found this before the live stream. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. look at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, wait, Tim, do you give him permission? Because I do. Are you? Are we cool with this? Uh, yeah. He's uh, like, he's like, if you guys <laughs> mind, I'm like, <laughs> my private video. <laughs> 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 oh man. All right. So yeah. No, so okay. Secularism. I, I give my submission of mind and will to the Pope. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> read it. <laughs> all right. All right. Pope Francis uh, uh, said this morning, we are always tempted to start from ourselves rather than from God, to put our own agendas before the gospel, to let ourselves be caught up in the winds of worldliness in order to chase after the fashions of the moment or to turn back to the time that providence has granted us in order to retrace our steps. Yet, uh, yes, let us be careful. Both the progressivism that lines up behind the world and the traditionalism that longs for a bygone world are not evidence of love, but of uh, infidelity. And so it's it, they are strong words at the end, right? But th I think this is the point, which is we have a problem of, of secularism and individualism. And in light of what the Lubach was, was writing, the council is addressing that very thing. And progressivism, and I would say as well as traditionalism, uh, are not compatible with this. And, and I think we need to lean on the council in this area. So I'll leave it at that. So, yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, beautiful homily, homily from His Holiness. Uh, very good, <laughs> very good words. Um, mm. I think that my challenge to both of y'all or any people who uh, critique the traditional view, <clears throat> yeah. I would say, for example, when I read Archbishop Lefebvre's biography and it says mm. that all the liberals at Vatican II were pushing for X, Y, Z, Mm -hmm. I find that problematic. And the reason is because at uh, shout out to Richard de Clou, for example, um, and like Henri de Lubac, there is a, there's a, a world of difference between the, what would become known as the communio thinkers. Yeah. One of them is Henri de Lubac, Joseph Ratzker, Carol Vatila. There's a world of difference between them yeah. and the progressives like, yeah. uh, like you know, Karl Rahner, Hans Kuhn. I'm mean, Hans Kuhn is really formally a heretic. He preached heresy. <laughs> Yeah. You know, he, etc. Um, and but the problem is that these two forces were more or less in, sort of in an alliance at Vatican II because they were both striving against the curia's um, uh, their assertions. But what I mean to say is that, like, if a trad comes along and fails to make that distinction between these two forces, yeah, um, I would <laughs> like I would like to ask you or anyone. Um, to make a distinction between uh, what Jeremiah just described, which is an enthusiastic neo-Jansenism, which goes straight to Sedevacantism or Eastern Orthodoxy, basically, be, be, mm -hmm. based on these all these assumptions. I would like you to distinguish between that and yeah. all of the major scholars and theologians and bishops and priests who have all critiqued Pope Francis publicly. We have the, the biggest example, of course, is Aidan Nichols. He signed mm -hmm. a document which accused Pope Francis of the canonical delict of heresy, and he is yeah. still published in Communio. So I, I think I would challenge you to face the fact that Aidan Nichols is not an enthusiast. He's a well-respected, world-renowned theologian, and he's not doing this because he's going into an enthusiastic spiral. Yeah, I think you should. I think you should distinguish between. The trads, and I concede, happily concede, that there are trads who get into the enthusiastic spiral. And I agree with that. But I'd yeah. say that there's also other people who are siding with this trad critique who are not in that, and they're actually in a different place. And I would just that I would, as just as you would want me to distinguish between communio and concilium, I would want mm -hmm. you to distinguish between the set a set a enthusiast trads with these other trads. Uh, let me let me say something real quick. Go ahead. So, yeah. I agree with him on that. Um, 
I agree. I it, I just lament the fact that the people that you're describing as not being enthusiastic, I think that they are going the way of the dodo. I think that that group is toast. Um, and I, I say that because um, you wrote you wrote an, you wrote an article, for example, talking about the fathers of a specific movement uh, of the trad movement, and you wrote it over at One Peter Five, and people can go and they can watch the video about these men. And find out what they say. You can go back and watch anything by the remnant uh, on YouTube for a very long time. Um, to me, the idea that that's not enthusiasm, I think, is kind of requires using words like silly putty, which I think is also a, mod, a kind of a Moderna trad thing to do. Um, that and that if if somebody's going and constantly, constantly saying it's not even Catholic. Is the Pope even Catholic? That kind of thing. Angels wouldn't even, the angels would be afraid to tiptoe around words like that. And, and a lot of these people go on YouTube and they just clamor around. They just, they jump up and down on graves, the, the democracy of the dead. And, and all the while calling themselves the lovers of the tradition and the lovers of the past. And it, but it's, it's mind blowing because their actions are quite contrary to that. And it's one of these things where, the reason why I think it's so hard now is because we're really far into it, right? I mean, we're now we're now entering what sixty years, sixty yeah. years of Vatican II, fifty years of the Novus <laughs> Ordo, and it doesn't look like it's changing. We can we can talk all the momentum in the world that we can talk about that's changing with more and more young people liking the Latin Mass. I go to the Latin Mass. My kids go to a church that's hardcore about tradition and a school that's hardcore about tradition. Um, but at the same time, I'm not. I'm not saying that it's like he's taken over the globe i say no it's got a really vibrant community of people that really love that mass and that really love the traditions of the church it's a vibrant powerful community they love god they love their neighbor and that's what that is but i don't i'm not out of my mind to think that that's going to just all of a sudden take over um you know and so but because that's the case because that's not happening and because it's continuing to go on the path that it's been going for quite a while I think that that resentment and that frustration, that anger, it builds. And, you know, without being addressed, it, it you know, I would like to say because it's not addressed, it's building up more and more and more. The problem yeah. is if we're honest about it, I think it's my contention that if we're honest about it, even if the church addressed it, the most basic and ruling assumptions that the trads have, they don't need to listen now. They don't need to submit right now. They don't. They can mock and ridicule. He's a heretic. What if they? What if they came down with the ruling on a dubia? What if they did? What if they addressed every single one of the very, may I may I say, very good suggestions and things that Tim has brought up about questions that are still out, outstanding? What if the church came and addressed those things? Would that be the end of it? Well, according to Jesus, it should be. According to our Lord, if you don't submit to that, then, well, you're toast. But that's not the way that it works right now with with in my in my experience with traditionalists. And I know very few who would say, well, if they just answered it, we'd do it because the truth is they're not doing it now. And because they're not doing it now, there'd be no reason for them to do it in the future, because a lot of the things they're not doing now are in in uh, resistance to things that have been, in fact, clarified or established or advanced by the church over time. And, and I, I'd love to make uh, those distinctions, uh, Tim. And I think I definitely could have uh, in the past, especially under Benedict, but it's just, it's, it's gotten hard for me to make that distinction when I read uh, any of the traditionalist um, authors or literature, it's just gotten to the point where I, I, I don't see, um, you know, what I see in the, in, in, for example, the communal school, but I don't know. It's just it's gotten so difficult to make that distinction anymore, if that makes sense. And it's sad because, you know, I have a lot of friends and family in the movement. And uh, yeah, and I love the 62, of course. So anyway. OK, I mean, I, I guess I would just um, again, I would, I would point you and viewers to, I mean, the official statements of these these people, um, these people who are not crazy dodo bird, whatever. Uh, I mean, these are respected yeah. theologians and mainstream people who are continually saying more things like that. I meant um, that they were going extinct, not that they were dumb. 
Do- Dodo bird. Yeah, that yeah I, I got. Yeah, yeah I, I, I didn't mean to imply that. You no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand not, they're going yeah, extinct. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 I guess I I read the past sixty years differently than that. Um, <clears throat> in I I have my series on Ratzinger. Um, at Meaning of Catholic is about traditionalism and Ratzinger, mm-hmm. and I, I guess I, in, in my view, I do see a continued growth of 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 a positive. Di- this is this is what uh, I think. Oh, is that Wolfgang or is it? Uh, <laughs> That's Wolfgang. He came. I heard the thump 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 of his feet, man, and all of a sudden I heard and Angela's like racing behind him and. It, I thought it was so loud. I was like, are the kids home? I'm like, no, it's only 2.30. And all of a sudden, man, door opens up. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Angela's coming by. Yeah, is it Wolf? What's up? <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> so I let, him, I let him come in. Just say hi. You got to say oh, hi yeah. one oh, time. Yeah. Wave real quick. Hey. hey. Yep, say bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Yeah. All right. I mean, this puts everything into perspective. Thank you, yeah, Wolfgang. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right there. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think that the, um, I, I mean, the basic, the basic. Okay. Let, let me just, again, let me concede all of y'all's points about yeah. trads, some trads, and, you know, just the attitude. But the basic, the basic thing is, um, the magisterium publicly and definitively promulgates doctrine a uh, like mm-hmm. the most recent statement against Pope Francis, yeah. which was signed by four bishops, uh, which, was, which was ridiculous. Um, it, well, it, it, I don't think yeah, it was sorry. ridiculous. And I'll tell you why I don't think it was ridiculous. Okay. I think it was reasonable. Here's what I'll assert. I'll say it was reasonable. You don't have, you don't have to agree, but I would say it's a reasonable mm-hmm. concern because Trent says one thing and that is, doctrine is mm. taught to all first communicants you cannot receive holy communion in a state of mortal sin and yeah. so this is not something that one requires a bunch of theological training or a bunch of something that public knowledge to all catholics who receive their first communion seven-year-olds should understand this most basic teaching and i i assert that it is reasonable to address concern to the roman mm-hmm. pontiff yeah. About this, which appears what what I loved about I, I did a podcast one Peter five about this, and I said that this is a good way to say this because it says mm-hmm. the document actually says to the Roman pontiff, this seems to teach this. It did not accuse him of heresy, it didn't say yeah. you definitely teach heresy at, at this point. It said mm-hmm. this seems to indicate something contrary to Trent. And mm-hmm. so it should be clarified and and it's not something it's the, the basics is that we have our catechism. We've got our basic teachings that we give to our children and our children should not have to come to us and say the Pope Francis did or said X, which doesn't make any sense to me because of what you taught me, dad. Yeah, we shouldn't yeah. have to be in that position. And I think that's a reasonable concern. I don't think that, yeah. that's crazy to no, no. Yeah. yeah. What's your thought? Well, well, Tim, so uh, when I read that passage, like right away, what came to mind to me was the book of Revelation and several things that St. Paul said. And uh, I, n- not once did it cross my mind that you you don't have to go to confession if you're in mortal sin to receive communion. Like uh, the garment of faith, like it, it was obvious to me he was talking about sanctifying grace because, you know, it, he's not talking about faith alone in the Protestant way. That's why, you know, uh, you know, Benedict talked about this as well. I mean, it wasn't confusing to me. Um, now, I can understand Good. that some people. Yeah. So do you, do you think it's reasonable for someone in good faith to be confused by that and take it the wrong way? I think that people can be confused by that, but what's reasonable is to uh look look into it to to take it, you know, in its context and I don't think that's difficult. And uh I I I, w- I was scandalized by that letter accusing not accusing, I don't know what it uh if it you know a- actually accused him, but bringing that up like that it was scandalous to me. I'm not I'm not too worried about that. I, okay. I'll, I'll throw this bone to Tim, right? We, we, <laughs> we, we, I'm serious. I'm dead serious, man. I, yeah. we're, we, I said, I'm closer serious. to you, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, like sometimes. Yeah. So we, Tim and I did a, a, an episode on, um, on the proper way of addressing problems to the yeah. church. Right. Um, and so in, in talking about that, there is an appropriate way. The church has not denied the idea that, theologians and the people wanting to address issues 
that they are able to do so in an orderly fashion and that mm-hmm. it is to be respectful. And that would be, to me, the matter of good faith. Tim, I think, brought that up, saying it seems like this. I think that's a sign of yeah. good faith because it leaves it open. They could be shown to be wrong, but it at least appears that this might be the case. So I think that I don't I'm not bothered by that at all. Um, however, yeah. I wish more people were nuanced like that. You know, that instead, sadly, the nuance is not like trickle down economics, like trickle down nuance or something (laughs) like it just doesn't happen. Most people, they just they just go for the gusto with this and accuse the church of these things. But also that that, that, that Benedict, when, uh, um, you know, when writing about this was saying that if you address these matters and you do it respectfully, you do it in an orderly fashion with the right, the proper, even layouts and stuff. And you don't go to media, you don't go to mass media and just blast it out there for everybody because you're, you're addressing it in a filial way. That's genuinely wanting to see resolution in the most orderly way, humanly possible with the least amount of scandal that Mm. in that situation, he said, they should do this because they know that this is not only how it works, but they know it's happened many times. Yeah. And he said, so we shouldn't have that. And I, I think somebody asked recently, it's the last thing I'll say about it. somebody. Somebody asked me, you know, well, do, do you not accept that the people that say this are in good faith? And I said, good faith would be this. Um, good faith. Number one, I believe these and all the other truths the Catholic Church teaches. Why? Because God, um, not because the Pope Francis is mega dope, not because <laughs> Benedict is super smart, nothing like that. Uh, Because God, because the Holy Ghost, because of bridal promises from a Savior who died on a cross and rose and now reigns with all power and authority in heaven. So it seems pretty easy to me that that's a good faith measure. But it's also good faith to to do what what Benedict writes about. And that would be the CDF to say, um, when you do this, that you take your time, that you patiently reflect, that Mm -hmm. you that you investigate. And I said, that doesn't jive. Here we are again with the social imaginary. That doesn't jive with with a society, with social media. How many of these guys, how many have daily talk shows or shows that are on four times a week or so and make articles and have to get the news out there? And they're blasting out their opinions on this stuff forcefully all the time without any without hardly skipping a beat. To me, that is a sign of bad faith. So on the one hand, saying it seems like that might be heresy. Or a pro, uh, uh, signing a document and presenting it to the church in that way, to me, mm-hmm. that's good faith. Uh, saying I'm more likely wrong, yeah. I'm more likely wrong than that the church is wrong, but yeah. I at least want to know. Um, in that regard, um, that's good faith. Bad faith would be dissent, which I take a different position than Tim on, <laughs> but I but we we have talked about it at least. And but, yeah. yeah. Well, Jeremiah, I think Donum Veritatis, I, I think if I'm not, if I don't, yeah, you're not mistaken. It. Yeah. It's uh, number nine, talks about the difference between uh, the, you know, the duty to be uh, critical versus the critical spirit, uh, talking about theologians. Um, and so what I, what I was saying about that document is that a lot of those who signed onto that document have, you know, recently come out on YouTube, uh, you know, accusing the Pope of heresy in a slew of accusations publicly as lay people. And to me, that 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 smells like a critical spirit, not someone seeking for clarification in good faith. That that's my uh, concern, if that makes sense. Well, I, it's I, I direct um, viewers to um, our, our contributing editor over at One Peter Five is Michael Cirilla at uh, Theologian at Franciscan, and he wrote an article called "The Morality of Correcting the Pope," in which he discusses Donum Veritatis. Edward mm-hmm. Fieser also has another article on Donum Veritatis. And when we, it's it's interesting because when we look at the context, <clears throat> the history of Joseph Ratzinger, this is what I get into in my series, Meaning of Catholic, yeah. Pope Benedict Re- vindicates the trads. It, it, because in 1960, Hans Kuhn was trying to manipulate Vatican II already as sort of using the media. So he was mm-hmm. this media star and he was trying to use the media to cook up a bunch of pressure on public opinion and many bishops caved into that too because they were scared of public opinion whatnot Mm -hmm. and then joseph ratziger in 1960 even before the council he rebukes hans kuhn for making this into some democratic thing Mm -hmm. and i i feel like dona veritatis is very much 
trying to contrast the communio and the concilium schools regarding the pre-Vatican II period, because mm -hmm. we have Henri de Lubac is silenced, you know, mm -hmm. and Ratzker is suspected. And he, I think he would say, uh, you know, we were trying to have a, a good critical spirit with the, the status yeah. quo magisterium. We were trying to have, yeah. hey, like, hey, we do need to have some resource them all. This is good. Yeah. But even though the magisterium is suspicious of us. So he's sort of, um, Joseph Ratzker exemplifies in his own life what Dona Veritatis mm -hmm. says in the letter, I think, which I, is a great thing. I agree. Thing. Yeah, um, I agree. And then I think he's contrasting that sort of implicitly with like what what people like Hans Kuhn did, because he did use the media to just sort of pressure people in a sort of a democratic society sort of way, instead of in a in a in really the um, you know the the mystical body of Christ how we should be really acting. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Uh, I, I guess my concern is that I, I just don't feel like that's the trajectory, uh, un unfortunately, in the traditionalist movement. But I think we disagree on that. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, feel free to you know add anything, Tim. But here's a uh, a question from uh, Yayun. Uh, how do we know your interpretation of Vatican II is correct if the wording is ambiguous and the magisterium has not clarified? I'll let you guys take a stab at that. Um, Tim, you want to uh, give a stab at that? Uh, sure. Well, Lumen Gentium, the appendix gives the theological norms of interpretation of Vatican II. And I would say that that resolves 95% of any issue with the text of Vatican II. And then there's mm -hmm. another 3% maybe that have, have actually been formally clarified. And then mm -hmm. I think there's a small percentage, like the Dave Emerald 11 passage that I mentioned, that have mm -hmm. not been formally clarified, but that's okay. And, I, and there yeah. was actually a, a previous commenter who he said he was Eastern Orthodox and he was confused about the different opinions. Mm. And uh, to that, I will say I, I used to be Eastern Orthodox. And to that, I will say that the Catholic Church allows for differing opinions on things that have not been definitively resolved. And that's mm. OK, yeah. because the, the magisterium works in the history of the church. You have these historical debates between like Dominicans and Jesuits on the nature of grace or this or that thing or. Uh, and different schools of thought bring forth different um, aspects of the different truth. Yeah. And at times the magisterium intervenes to resolve something definitively. And at times the magisterium just sort of hands off and just lets theologians debate it. Yeah. Now, the difference between the Eastern Orthodox Church is that they don't have a living magisterium. They have a dead magisterium. The dead magisterium, yeah. it died in 787 at the last ecumenical council. They don't mm -hmm. have a Lydvian magisterium to resolve their theological disputes. And so the Eastern Orthodox just divide with each other. And they, they have there's a different sacramental theology between Moscow and Constantinople, for example. Yeah. Um, and this is just never going to be resolved unless they have a living magisterium that they can resurrect from the dead. But they can't do that without outside of union with Rome. Mm -hmm. So that would be what I would say. In uh, I agree. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'd say we don't know. The, ch the church, if it church doesn't answer it and there's a debate, then we're back to, to step one of the the process that our Lord advises us to take to the church. You have disagreement with your brother, go and talk to him. So we're there, guys. <laughs> like if you have a situation, you know, like different disagreements between uh, the, uh, the the Thomas and the Scotus, right? Yeah. Disagreements yeah. <laughs> between classical apologetics and presuppositional apologetics, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, seriously, though, but, you know, like things yeah. like that, you, you have major differences. The church doesn't say anything about it and basically yeah. says, just don't kill each other, right? It, it'd be cool because it got, it's been out of control before. Stuff has gotten wicked bad. And so the church tones it down, says you guys got to cool your jets. Um, but there's a huge amount of, room for people to develop those ideas and those thoughts. Um, and so I, I, I have no problem in saying that, saying that those things would be outstanding, but to the degree that we, uh, those things are not ambiguous and those things are not up for discussion. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. It was it St. Augustine who said in a central unity in opinions, diversity, but in all charity. I, I'll uh, say one more thing about it is that I think sometimes I don't think they need to answer so much with a direct answer. If, if, if a group moves forward, and yeah. is applying something, an understanding of something, and the church is applying it in that manner with mm -hmm. that understanding. And it's taught by the Pope successively. It's taught in the universities by the theologians, the vast majority of them, and all of that. And it's made an impact even institutionally within the church. At that point, I'm like, that speaks 
for itself, you know, and you say, mm -hmm. well, you actually would have to then if you pulled that back, <laughs> like it's it's mind boggling to imagine um, yeah, yeah. what would happen. Sean says, we actually don't need these YouTube theologians. We can trust the church and the magisterium. Well, you definitely don't need uh, the Logos Project. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, the goal here is to help um, deliver what the magisterium is teaching uh, to the lay people. Um, okay, let's see if we have any more questions. Anything you guys I think I think add? that on the one hand, the church people do not need me or you or Tim, mm -hmm. right, in that way. On the mm -hmm. other hand... I think they think we need each other in general. Yeah. And I, I love that the church, and I love, I love how Vatican II addressed the laity and how they, uh, how the church addressed apostolates. It's one of the things I love about me of Catholic and why, again, it's, it's a special place. It's an amazing place. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and, and part of it is because it really does try to embody what the church has said um, in her, in her council regarding lay yeah. apostolates. And in that regard, the church, whether in two documents, one about uh, social media and one about uh, yeah. one about mass communication and yeah. one about uh, apostolates, you you combine those two together. You can't walk away thinking that the church doesn't believe that she needs her faithful uh, and those lay apostolates going out into the world to help advance that mission in modern times. Yeah. I'll just that's I'll leave it at that. Yeah, but but at the core of it, could you survive? And just simply have the, the magisterium and not even worry about any YouTubers. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The church did a long time, but without YouTube. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I mean, this is just an action of um, like meaning if Catholic in our constitution, we talk about the different lay roles. Primary role is, is as parents. So we are catechizing our children. Mm -hmm. And so the church definitely needs lay parents obviously to form their children that's what's that's what uh, uh apostolicum axiositatem says vatican II. it says yeah. that parents are the primary formators of their children in the apostolate we have to form our own children so that they can go out and be the apostolate in the world and traditionally there's also lay preachers and these are uh <clears throat> religious who take vows of the religious vows mm -hmm. and they go and exhort the people to simply have faith and they're they're not trying to resolve higher theological problems uh yeah. you know we're none of us here are even theologians we're just yeah. we're just trying to um i mean i think the main message here is what jeremiah said like to have faith in the church mm -hmm. that it's okay that there's some difference of opinion on these these things that are they're less of lesser uh import um, and the lay preachers, the lay religious preachers were just exhorting the people to penance, exhorting the people yeah. to faith and charity. And so that's ultimately the main message of meaning of Catholic is, is that I, when I started the meaning of Catholic, because I had been Eastern Orthodox and I came into communion with Rome right after Pope Francis was elected. And it was like, uh, what, six years, five or six years when the the summer of shame came and McCarrick and all that like second sex scandal started to come out. And mm -hmm. I started to see people lose faith in the church and start to have a crisis of faith. And I, I, I felt so sad because to me, yeah. I, I was just such at, at so much peace since I had come into the community with Rome. I was like, Oh, I'm so thankful that I don't have to be Eastern Orthodox anymore. I don't have to try to like have a PhD and figure out all these patristics and stuff. I just can have yeah. the magisterium. And, um, so meaning of Catholic is just trying to basically like encourage people, give lay faithful. Here's your basic tools that the church has already given us. We've already, he's already given us these catechisms and all these resources so we can catechize ourselves. We can catechize our children. And that resolves 90% of all these controversies. And as for the rest, we can just yeah. let the theologians figure those things out. It's not our, it's not our job. I don't need to, I mean, we, we've got disagreements yeah. here in this whole show based on these yeah. theological matters. But, <laughs> Thank God. I don't there, even have to yeah. worry about that. Let the, let yeah. the magisterium and the, and yeah. the theologians figure out those things. And I'll just yeah. get on with catechizing my children and doing I think, what I need to do. I think yeah. one of the things that, you know, cause I'm, I'm a journalist by education and degree. Now I went to Bible college and I, I plan, I'm hoping to be returning to seminary as a Catholic now. Um, and so I, I go back to seminary. I'm, I've talked to a professor over at Byzantine seminary and so really excited mm. about that it's a good possibility that that's going to happen um so but in the meantime i'm a journalist i am a journalist who i study these different topics 
I, I try my best to follow who I think are giants of the faith who've proven themselves over time. I mm -hmm. maintain a position that even Tim would say is maybe the safest. <laughs> he said, like we've talked about it before, there's different positions that you can maintain and that it seems as though this one is at least safe, right? And I maybe it's the the wager of if I am wrong, I can say I, I prayed that act of faith and I trusted the magisterium. I, I read the catechism. I read the documents. Mm -hmm. I did my best. Um, and not that I was wrong and disobeying. <laughs> but the idea being mm -hmm. that like, even at Meaning of Catholic, that we have different, you know, Tim has a different set of theologians that he looks to and says, these guys are a bigger influence on him than they would be on me. And my people that I like and mostly identify with are mm -hmm. theologians over in this school. But we are on a tier where you have people who write articles and submit white papers and stuff like that. And then you have people who essentially popularize those that say, I am yeah. doing my best to reflect this system because I believe it. I want to know how I know the best I can on what this is. And yeah. to the extent that we may deviate, we emphasize opinion and say, mm -hmm. this is my opinion, you know, and sometimes I haven't done a good job with that. And Tim's always been a faithful person to, to help me with that, to say, because I can thunder sometimes. I'm a son of thunder <laughs> on that. And, and that he's like, bro, you know, we got to You got to be careful. We're just dudes. It's our opinion. And so, you know, I'll, I'll say, yeah, that's, you're right. And so mm -hmm. I think that's good though, because people, most people can't, they don't even know where to find those papers, man. They don't know. They wouldn't be able to read that language. They'd be frustrated with it. Whereas people like us and people like you and shows like these are able to discuss those issues without saying you must submit to what I'm saying. Right. And discuss those things so that those people can learn to deepen their faith, too. But it's also why most of my work is about defending the faith. Mm -hmm. Right. Not not defining new things, but saying, how do we defend the, the Catholic worldview? How do we do that? And mm -hmm. the other thing is talking about how to stay away from cults. Right. Like, how do we <laughs> stay away from that? Um, talking about nihilism, uh, uh, nihilism, talking about, um, you know, er things like that and and how to raise kids. The Lasant series is all about that. And so and we're going to be doing one. My, my uh, Jake and I, we're going to we're talking in behind the scenes about doing stuff even for first communicants and stuff like that, talking about the catechism for them. And so things like that, that um, that's the emphasis, not on yeah. not on settling once and for all for all for all people in all places at all times. Flanders and Paleocrat have spoken <laughs> like, that's <just laughs> so fake. So yeah. as long as people keep a head on their shoulders in the right place and their hearts in the right place being of good faith. I think that we, we can help the church as the church has said we could. Yeah, I agree. And I think, yeah, these apostolates are, uh, as long as they stay, uh, you know, um, faithful and, you know, the catechism and all that kind of stuff, I think they're very good help for lay people who don't have time to read all these theologians. Yeah. So wonderful. Well, uh, we've gone an hour and 13 minutes. I think this might be a good place to stop. It was uh, a delight to have both of you on. You're uh, you're both welcome back on whenever you, you'd like. Um, so audience, make sure you like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, comment down below. Uh, and if you enjoy this kind of content, support us at patreon.com slash the logos project. Uh, Jeremiah, any parting words? I love the show. You're a cool <laughs> dude. You. And and people and people should go. Yes, I do. I do. I strongly encourage everybody to go and support the apostolates that had they benefit from. Um, we live in a day and age that I call them Burger King commie Catholics, right? That they, <laughs> it's my way right away, free of charge now. And that's yeah. the thing. And so they, they want it all free of charge. We just, but we all, all of us kind of do. Right. And, mm -hmm. but people, the people you're seeing on the screen right now, take time to provide the content that you're tuned into right now. And that time could be used doing different things, but they love the church. They feel that God has led them to do something with their gifts and talents that he gave them to them for a reason and for such a time as this. And so if, if you're someone who loves this kind of content and you're someone who wants to see the men on this screen and those that they're associated with and the ideas that they advance to advance in the world, consider becoming a patron. 
and just check out their, just go to Patreon, you know, and look at it. Meaning of Catholic, <laughs> uh, look at the logos project, look at paleocrat diaries, look at whatever you support and think even in small ways that five bucks is five bucks. I mean, that's, you know, enough five bucks and you got 50. Right. And so, and that helps, that helps big time, especially for dudes like us with bigger families. <laughs> it helps a lot. Cause I'm going to have to buy a big, huge van soon. You know, you know, man. So, so just think about it because it's what we love to do and yeah. we'll do it no matter what we're, we're doing it now and we ain't making a bunch of loot. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, true. Yeah. It's true. We made it. We were doing this stuff and not making a penny because yeah. we believe it. And but God is good. And so are Catholics. So <laughs> so I simply ask them, you know, to to check it out, to pray about it, reflect on it. Talk to your wife, talk to your husband and <laughs> uh, and then make a decision. Wonderful. Timothy, any uh, parting words? Oh, just uh, thank you. Uh, it's it's always a good um it's always a good thing to have just sort of the trad and the conservative or whatever you want to call it and, <laughs> yeah. and have these back and forth. Cause I, it's, I think it grieves the heart of Jesus when there's yeah. such bitter vitriol between Catholics and we mm -hmm. really are, we're in communion at the most holy sacrifice of the altar as one. And, and we should, mm -hmm. it should grieve our hearts that, that Catholics have this bitter echo chamber because that's yeah. totally contrary to the communion that we all share in the body of Christ. So it, it really just warms my heart to to have this whole conversation. So thank you, Dom. Appreciate your own uh, willingness to have this nice conversation. And uh, uh, until next time. Anytime. Thank you all. Uh, we'll see you guys next time.